Wonderful. Okay. Hi, I'm Ed Levin, um, director of the uh, Duke Center on Addiction and Behavior Change, and welcome to our seminar series of the spring of 2021. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to give you a little uh, look ahead. Uh, on March 24th, uh, we're going to have Kathleen Kantag from Boston University uh, talk to us about extinction memory enhancement for cocaine relapse prevention and her work with pharmacological uh, interventions and molecular determinants and animal models and acute exposure therapy. And then on the 14th of April, we have our own uh, Nicole Shamsapeta. Uh, we'll be uh, giving uh, a talk uh, about the uh, relationship between mental health services and law enforcement in Durham County. So this is a really uh, all about uh, community outreach and um, you know, feet on the ground and, and what, what's really going on in the community. Uh, and then uh, on the 28th, to finish off our spring semester, we have uh, Isaac Lipskus from the uh, nursing school who's going to talk to us about water, water pipe exposure, uh, uh, smoking and, uh, in young adults. Um, so I am putting together the fall seminar series. And um, if anyone has a uh, burning desire to present uh, their, their research or, or their work, um, please get in touch. Or if you want to nominate someone to, to do that, uh, Actually, uh, we're most likely still going to be uh, virtual at that point. So, um, you know, we can uh, bring in all sorts of people from around the world with time zone as our only constraint. Uh, so, um, pretty, uh, think broadly. Um, so, today I'd like to introduce, uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Stacy Bilbo, who's a professor in the psychology and neuroscience department here at Duke. Um, um, she uh, earned her uh, bachelor's at the University of Texas at Austin and went on and, <coughs> and did her uh, master's and PhD uh, work and uh, earned those degrees at Johns Hopkins University and then went on uh, postdoctoral work at the University of Colorado. Uh, Stacy was here at Duke uh, for a number of years in the, the psychology department and then um, um, went off to uh, the bright lights of Boston with uh, Harvard University and <coughs> then <coughs> Um, we were very fortunate to have her come back, and I'm so glad that she's here. Uh, she's a world leader in terms of uh, looking at uh, developmental neuroimmunology and the uh, uh, important interactions between neural and immune systems. And uh, uh, I, I like uh, her, her uh, uh, philosophy uh, it's expressed on her website. We believe that mental health includes the entire body. So um, I'm all for the integrated organism. And as much as we like to uh, pick apart the third, fourth, and 12th messenger system, uh, it all does come back together and uh, in terms of the integrated organism. And, and uh, we need to consider how the brain uh, interacts within itself and also the brain interacts with the rest of the body and the body interacts with the rest of the world. So um, today, um, uh, Stacy is gonna tell us about her work with neuroglial interactions and substance use disorders. Stacy. Thank you very much. I'm happy to um, introduce or talk about some of this work. I don't think I've given a talk in this series maybe ever. Um, so um, my um, goal was to sort of give an outline of all of the work we've been doing in this arena for um, the past decade or even more. Um, and I'm happy to get your feedback. So the sort of large or overarching goal of the research in my lab like Ed just said, is to really understand how uh, the, the endocrine, the nervous, and the immune systems talk to each other and how this um, is important in both health and disease outcomes. So considering most uh, mental uh, uh, health outcomes as uh, sort of a culmination of, of the entire body. And we're particularly interested in how microglia, the resident immune cells of the CNS, are important in this crosstalk between the nervous and the immune systems. And again, how this is important in both healthy brain function and also um, pathology. So, uh, over the past couple of decades, we've learned a lot about microglia. There's been an increasing amount of interest in what they're doing. Um, we know that, as I mentioned, they are the sort of host immune cells um, of the brain, um, but they're not simply sitting in the brain waiting for something to happen. They are, in fact, incredibly dy dynamic and, and active cells 
that are constantly surveying their environment, listening to neural activity, listening to synaptic activity. Um, and, uh, and we think that this is, is quite important for um, the way that, that the brain functions broadly. And this includes in the context of addiction, we're increasingly understanding that um, drugs of abuse, in particular opioids, which I'll talk about today, but also alcohol, which we're beginning to study, um, can directly activate microglia via uh, innate uh, immune receptors, notably toll-like receptors, and that this can lead to the transcription and production of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And there's now a lot of evidence that this activation of microglia as well as astrocytes, um, so the sort of classically immune cells of the brain can have profound implications for several aspects of addiction, including reward, tolerance, dependence, et cetera. So of course the million dollar question is what are microglia doing and how might they be impacting the neuroplasticity mechanisms underlying addiction? And when I think about microglial function within the brain, um, it's sort of um, easy to categorize them into sort of two major categories of functions. One is that they secrete lots of things. So lots of um, mediators or um, uh, communication uh, molecules like cytokines and chemokines, which then communicate with other cell types um, like neurons and astrocytes. So they secrete a bunch of things. And then they also have a big role in synapse um, sculpting in particular. Um, so they can impact synapse formation, uh, usually in collaboration with astrocytes. And what they're probably best known for is their role in synaptic pruning. So in this case, uh, what's uh, diagrammed here is that microglia have receptors like CD11B, which recognize tags like complement proteins, which get deposited onto synapses um, and that synapse is then removed by microglia. And this often happens in an activity dependent manner. So often weaker synapses get removed. Um, and this is just part of a, a normal part of, of brain development as well as ongoing brain function. But as I said, we increasingly think that some of these processes may be important for addiction mechanisms. And so today I'll talk about sort of two parts of the work that we've been doing, which um, touches on both of these two major categories of functions. The first part being the role of secreted inflammatory factors in opioid seeking and relapse. And the second, the role of microglial pruning um, of receptors in opioid seeking and relapse. And we think that both of these functions have relevance for addiction and um, very likely other reward-driven psychopathologies. So I'm gonna go way back to sort of the beginning of when we started all of this work, which uh, was the work of my very first postdoc, Jackie Schwartz, who joined me here just a couple years into my um, assistant professorship here. She's now an associate professor herself. Um, but one of the first experiments we ever did was simply to take rats, treat them with morphine or saline, and look at what happened um, within the brain, specifically at immune signaling within the brain in response to morphine. And so as you all know, uh, despite the fact that we have diverse drugs that impact the brain, we know that they all converge onto the mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway. Uh, so all, all roads eventually lead to the nucleus accumbens. So a lot of the work that I'll show you um, is focused on this brain region, although we're increasingly looking at other regions of the brain like PFC and hippocampus um, and amygdala, but I'll focus on accumbens for this talk. So one of the first things we did was simply look at gene expression in response to this morphine signal. So um, this was before RNA sequencing was all the rage. Um, so we simply did a PCR array for about 100 inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And what you can see is that morphine very robustly upregulates many different inflammatory factors. And it downregulated one gene in particular, which turned out to be fractalkine which is quite interesting because fractalkine is a ligand that's expressed on the surface of neurons and it actually keeps uh, microglia sort of in a, a tonic um, sort of quiescent um, state. Um, so you have this release of uh, neuronal inhibition on microglia and a profound upregulation of, of inflammatory gene expression. So 
why do we care? Does this have any impact on rewarding or addictive properties of drugs of abuse? And so one of the first things we did was to do a condition place preference task uh, with rats in which we condition uh, rats with morphine, give them morphine in one side of a very um, distinct chamber. And we do this uh, across a couple of days. And then on the fourth day, we test the preference for um, that morphine paired side. And as you uh, as you know, more, uh, rats typically prefer uh, the chamber that they previously received morphine in. And then we had an additional manipulation in this experiment where we gave the, the rats on each day that they would receive either the morphine or the saline, um, an additional drug called a butylast or saline. And a butylast is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that has now moved all the way into use in humans in both alcoholism and opioid addiction. And the reason we became interested in it is because of reports that it may have anti-inflammatory properties. And uh, so we tested this and indeed this is what we found. So this is that same gene expression profile. If you give a butylast plus morphine, it almost completely prevents this large increase in pro-inflammatory cytokine and chemokine expression by morphine. And so this is um, some of the gene expression quantified. And so as you can see, the black bar is this very robust upregulation by morphine and a butylast pretty much just shuts it down. And I want to point out too that, you know, these are not sort of the canonical pro-inflammatory cytokines we all think about, like TNF-alpha and IL-1 beta and IL-6, but they're actually more in the chemokine family, which we think is pretty intriguing. The other thing I want to point out about this figure, though, is that here's this downregulation of fractalkine, abutilast increases fractalkine, and abutilast did one additional thing, and that is that it profoundly upregulated IL-10. And IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and it will become important later in the talk as well. So, so clearly a, a pretty striking anti-inflammatory function of this drug. So what does it do to behavior? Well, if we just look at condition place preference on the test day on that day four, um, what we found was no effect of abutilast. So it actually had no impact that all of the rats very robustly showed preference for the morphine paired chamber. But um, going into this, we knew, and as you know, um, one of the most uh, difficult aspects of addiction is not the fact that you have reward from an abused substance, but rather, um, it's the cycle that then continues. So we know it's a chronically relapsing disorder. So we wanted to test this in our rats. So we extinguished this CPP behavior for four weeks and then let them have a sort of abstinence period for an additional four weeks. And then we tested reinstatement to this CPP behavior by giving them a priming dose of morphine uh, again in the chamber. And here, what we found is Again, this is at that initial reward. When we gave them this priming dose of morphine, the vehicle treated rats um, showed immediate reinstatement to that um, condition place preference. But those that were treated with a butylast nine weeks earlier now um, showed no reinstatement whatsoever. And then we did it again with a higher dose just to see if it was a dose dependent thing. And again, the vehicles uh, reinstate uh, strongly and no reinstatement at all um, in the ones that were treated with abutilast. So we next wanted to extend this model. And we all know that um, self-administration is the gold standard in addiction studies. Um, so is this just because we're you know, not giving them a choice in the matter or can we extend this to their own intake of opioid? So we started um, what has now been a long-standing and fruitful collaboration with, with Ed. And this is the work of Michael Licanina in my lab, a graduate student at the time. And um, we trained rats to lever press for a short-acting opioid called remifentanil. Um, we use the short-acting drug because if, if we use morphine, then they, you know, they they take one press and then they sort of take a nap. And so it's not, not as useful in these uh, self-administration experiments. One of the very first experiments Michael did is to this day, I think one of the most interesting, which is just a pilot experiment where he took 
just naive adult sprayed golly rats, I put them in, started to train them on this procedure and saw what happened. And what he did was that he started them at this low dose of remifentanil for seven days, and then he ramped them up to a higher dose. And what you can see is that they basically divided into two groups, those rats that started to really accelerate their intake and those that did not. And he's seen this actually more than once. So there are striking individual differences and, and again, completely naive rats. And then he took their brains and he looked at just a gross measure of microglial um, reactivity or activation using a marker called IBA1 within the nucleus accumbens. And in both the core and shell, what you can see is that we have much higher microglial uh, reactivity in those that were high responders compared to low or no access rats. So again, pretty striking. Um, so something seems to be going on with microglial uh, activity and this, uh, this a tendency to take more drug. But of course, it's always the chicken or the egg here, which comes first. Is it the change in glial function leading to the higher intake, or is it the higher intake leading to uh, the change in glial function? And this, of course, is a million dollar question for the field. So why do some people go on to become uh, uh, addicted to drugs and others don't? Um, and we know that that addiction is extremely complicated, involving all kinds of different factors, but cutting across all of these things is something that my lab is particularly interested in, and that is the role of development. And we know that um, uh, in humans, um, uh, children's sort of earliest experiences, and particularly as they move into adolescence, is one of the strongest predictors for addiction liability later in life. So um, people that come from um, early neglect or early life stress sorts of situations are much more likely to abuse drugs later in life. And so we became very interested in this, even sort of uh, applying it to that individual difference that we saw in these rats. So what is going on there? Because presumably none of them were really stressed but we know that um, in rats, this has been well defined with a, with a pretty large literature at this point, that naturally occurring variations in maternal care have very profound effects on uh, endpoints later in life, cognitive endpoints, uh, affective endpoints, etc. And so this has been defined um, uh, extensively by uh, initially Michael Meany's lab and then all of his um, sort of trainees that went off into the world and formed their own labs. Um, so the amount of licking and grooming and archback nursing that, that rats receive early in life has these uh, profound effects on, on endpoints later in life. And they've described this in many, many papers now, the mechanisms underlying these persistent changes um, and the epigenetic programming of, of genes, including glucocorticoid receptor, which impacts stress reactivity, um, which again, persistently changes neural and behavioral um, outcomes. So taking this sort of paradigm, we wondered, well, can we just manipulate maternal care uh, in a very simple way and then see what impact it has on um, these sort of um, addiction outcomes that we're uh, looking at? So we went back to our condition place preference um, task um, and uh, we did a, a procedure called a neonatal handling procedure in which we simply separate moms from their pups for 15 minutes a day during the postnatal period, P2 to P20. And when we put mom back in with the, their pups, she licks and grooms them a lot more. And so we now have a, a condition of sort of augmented maternal care versus control. And the first thing we wanted to do was simply look at, um, well, we looked at behavior and we wanted to look at the same sort of gene expression profile that I showed you before. So using this paradigm, what we found um, in the CPP and then the extinction reinstatement paradigm is that handled rats show very, very different uh, drug-seeking behavior. So first of all, they don't condition as strongly, although they do show a significant preference for uh, the morphine paired side, and then they do not reinstate at all. So here's the control rats, which look just like the control rats that I showed you previously. But perhaps the most striking thing 
is that this neonatal handling paradigm completely blunted the pro-inflammatory response within the nucleus accumbens. So I promise you this is a different graph from what I showed you before, but instead of these uh, bars here being the abutilast treated groups, these are now the handled rats treated with saline or morphine. And what you can see here with the gray bars is that the pro-inflammatory response is just completely blunted. And then there was one additional gene that was actually different at baseline, which we were very interested in, because it turned out to be IL-10. So this is just at baseline without any manipulation. We have about five-fold higher constitutive levels of anti-inflammatory IL-10 within the nucleus accumbens of handled rats. And then through a series of experiments that I won't go into in the interest of time, what we found is that this is epigenetically programmed. So the IL-10 gene is demethylated in the handled rats, and this is specifically in microglia. So we had to um, purify out just a, a pure population of microglia to see this, and we found this um, pretty um, striking reduction in methylation, which then of course confers the increased um, expression of this gene. So this is really intriguing to us because it, it really gets to the heart of one of the primary questions um, that we're interested in in my lab, which is the sort of early experiences of microglia, where they come from and how they uh, basically infiltrate the CNS and impact brain development. Um, so as you may know, microglia don't come from the neural ectoderm, they come from the fetal yolk sac during a period of primitive hematopoiesis early in development. So they come in during this period um, and they then, uh, as, uh, as all macrophage populations in the body, begin to colonize the brain. So the microglia are not unique from this perspective. Again, all of the resident macrophage populations initially come from this yolk sac island. But what is unique about the brain is that the blood-brain barrier then closes. And there's a lot of evidence that it's this very early initial population of microglia that come into the CNS that then give rise to all of the microglia throughout the rest of the lifespan. And the other thing that's important is that microglia are very long-lived. They actually turn over very slowly which then introduces the possibility, and we have evidence for this, that if something happens during these early developmental stages, that you can program and alter their function very long-term. And of course, I just showed you an example in which we can epigenetically change these cells. Um, and this we think has a, a, a persistent impact on behavior. So then the question of course is, is what implication does this have for neurological disorders, including addiction? So going back to this IL-10, is it actually meaningful? Um, so we looked at IL-10 levels in each individual rat and related it to their initial condition place preference score, which remember was not altered by a butylase. And we found no correlation between the level of IL-10 in the accumbens and the amount of reward that they showed on that day four test day. But if you correlate the amount of IL-10 in the nucleus accumbens and compare it to their reinstatement, we now see a very strong re, uh, correlation. So the higher the IL-10 in the nucleus accumbens, the less likely they are to reinstate or the decreased reinstatement that they show. So we think that IL-10 levels in the nucleus accumbens are specifically predicting the amount of relapse or reinstatement. So to test this um, more directly, we went back to our self-administration paradigm uh, in collaboration with Ed. But the first thing we needed to do was figure out a way to manipulate IL-10 expression by microglia. And as uh, for all of you who may have worked with microglia, you know that they are very difficult cells to transfect. So we can't use um, traditional um, viral vector strategies with these cells because the virus doesn't get expressed. Um, but a collaborator of ours, uh, Linda Watkins and Peter Grace figured out that if you package the IL-10 gene or presumably other genes um, into a naked plasmid DNA and then 
um, administer it along with a sugar called d mannose that microglia become very interested now in this and they eat the plasmid and then they express the gene. And that's what this is showing here, that d mannose packaged together with the plasmid DNA containing IL-10 uh, results in a very robust upregulation of IL-10 uh, uh, in vitro. And then we did it again and showed that this is mostly because microglia are expressing IL-10. So other cells, and we think it's probably astrocytes are eating a little of the plasmid as well, but it's really mostly microglia that are now overexpressing IL-10. And then uh, Michael showed it in vivo as well. So he injected the plasmid along with D-mannose into the accumbens and again showed persistent overexpression of IL-10 within the Cummins. So now the question is, can we make a control rat look sort of like a handled rat or a rat treated with a butylast? Will they take less opioid? And so um, this is what we did. Basically they get trained to lever press for food and then they get the, the plasmid. And then we do that same sort of ramping up of remifentanyl um, lever pressing low dose followed by a high dose. And it's not a, it's not a huge effect, but it's a significant effect that when, when they're at the low dose, there's no difference regardless of whether they get the plasmid. But once they start to ramp up to that higher dose, only the ones receiving the control plasmid start to show that accelerated intake. So overexpression of IL-10 is preventing that, um, that uh, sort of ramping up of, of taking drug. And so we think that IL-10 is probably one of several mediators that is protective uh, in, in the face of uh, drug taking. So to conclude this part of the talk, what I've shown you is that abutilast, um, which is a drug that's now used clinically in humans, along with its cousin called apremilast, which actually is similar but has fewer side effects. And that is showing really, really amazing results in alcohol and opioid use right now. So happy to talk about that at the end. But this drug profoundly inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokine expression um, in response to morphine, and it completely prevents reinstatement tested weeks and weeks later. It increases IL-10, and we found that IL-10 expression levels at the time of the initial condition place preference are a very strong predictor of the levels of reinstatement. We found that this plasmid DNA um, into the accumbens decreases the self-administration of opioids and that early life experience may impact addiction liability later via long-term epigenetic changes in glial function. And we found evidence for changes in IL-10, but likely other genes are being modified by this early experience as well, which is something we're very interested in. Okay, so to shift now to the second part of the talk, which is not what microglia are sort of spitting out or producing these sort of inflammatory factors that, that I think most people are familiar with when they think about microglia, is their direct sculpting of circuits that may underlie addiction liability. So, most people show this sort of uh, statistic at the beginning of their talk, but I'm showing it here um, just to remind you. Uh, and this was in 2016. Uh, and unfortunately, with COVID, the opioid epidemic is uh, even worse. Um, so uh, it's a, a pretty startling uh, problem, as you know. But the reason I wanted to put it here is because um, I'm shifting now the focus to the adolescent period. Um, we know that um, adolescence is really prime time for um, sort of experimenting with drugs. And perhaps the most startling statistic I've ever seen in my career is this one, which is that nine out of 10 people with substance problems started using by the age of 18. So adolescence is interesting because it's increasingly um, thought to be a period of sort of standalone plasticity. And what I mean by that is rather than there, there being sort of a steady decline in plasticity mechanisms from early in life to adulthood, you have this sort of re-engagement of plasticity mechanisms that may have sort of um, gone back to, to um, basal levels prior to this period. 
which is quite interesting when you think about what the mechanisms might be underlying this increased um, sort of vulnerability during adolescence. And we know that the dopaminergic reward circuit undergoes similar plasticity changes during adolescence. So dopamine input into the accumbens changes dramatically. Uh, dopamine receptor expression in the accumbens changes dramatically, which I'll touch on in a moment. And of course, we think about the relevance of this for drugs of abuse, um, but these things are happening because of natural reward-seeking changes, and in particular, social interaction um, is changing dramatically in adolescence. And this is something that we became very interested in understanding, you know, what are the neuroplasticity changes that are occurring that underlie social behavior? And then what might be the relevance of that for uh, addiction? So another reason we became very interested in the period of adolescence is because of microglia. <laughs> um, so back to some experiments that um, Jackie did when she was here. Um, we had been working for some time on the um, just mapping out when microglia arrive in different brain regions um, in male and female rats and looking at density and then looking at things like gene expression and how they change over time. So just in naive, unmanipulated rats, what we found in the accumbens was really interesting. So basically, microglia show up a lot later into the nucleus accumbens than they do in some other brain regions. So there's very few early in life, and there's sort of like this steadily increase in their number until postnatal day 30, when the accumbens basically just explodes with the number of microglia not only the number, but their morphology changes really dramatically. So they sort of um, acquire this very reactive, so-called activated phenotype, suggesting to us they, there's something important going on. So a few years later, another postdoc, Ashley Kopeck, who also now has her own lab, uh, joined the lab and said, you know, this pattern is really interesting because it's similar to what you see with D1 and D2 expression within the nucleus accumbens, in which you see a peak in expression right around postnatal day 30, which then declines, leading to the very simple question of whether these two events are related. So are microglia potentially refining dopamine receptors during this adolescent period? Um, so I told you at the beginning, we know that microglia prune synapses. So is it possible that microglia are pruning D1 receptors? And we know microglia prune synapses in a complement dependent manner. So again, these complement proteins like C3 get deposited onto the synapse for removal by microglia, which express the receptor CD11B, which very precisely recognizes that complement protein and the synapse is then removed. Um, so we simply investigated whether this might be happening in adolescence. And so just to remind you, in the accumbens, the majority of cells are these GABAergic median spiny neurons and they express D1 or D2 in roughly equal portions. We have really focused um, on D1 because of their importance in social behavior, which I, I mentioned before um, has become an interest in terms of, especially during this adolescent period. So for instance, we know that if you optogenetically stimulate the projection from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, um, you can modify social behavior and this is specifically mediated by these type 1 D, D receptors. Um, and so uh, for this reason, we focused initially on D1. So for the D1 aficionados in the crowd, um, you probably know that if you've tried to stain for D1, um, most of the antibodies are a bit finicky. So we went through a lot of trouble to really validate that we were looking at D1 protein expression in uh, our hands. Um, so this is the, the in situ hybridization of D1 expression from the Allen Brain Atlas. And this is now our antibody staining, which looks uh, virtually identical. And we also validated this um, with a D1R knockout mouse, uh, which we uh, received from Mark Caron's lab here and show no expression of D1 in the knockout mouse. So we're very confident that we are looking at the D1 protein directly. 
And this is really important for the question that we're asking because we want to know if microglia are very specifically engulfing the receptor. So we need to be able to visualize the protein directly within the microglial cell. So the first thing Ashley did was to simply look at a timeline of D1 expression um, in the nucleus accumbens and consistent with previous literature, she found that indeed the receptor peaks in expression at postnatal day 30 and then rapidly declines. That complement protein C3 overlaps the same time point, again peaking at P30, and the co-localization shows that very precise overlap as well. And microglia, consistent with what we had seen previously, start to show a really interesting morphological change at P30 as well. So they start to look very amoeboid and reactive, as if they might be doing something important. <laughs> so then the question is, are they doing anything uh, to the receptor? Are they actually potentially engulfing the receptor? So to address this question, we do these 3D reconstructions, taking a Z-stack and reconstructing the entire cell and then just asking how much D1 is inside the microglial cell and specifically how much of the C3 labeled D1R is inside the microglial cell. And so this is D1R in microglia and you can see again, it peaks precisely at P30. And importantly, the tag itself, the complement protein, does not show a developmental time pattern um, because presumably C3 is doing lots of things in brain development. But if you look specifically at the C3 tag D1R, again, it really increases in microglia at P30. There's still a lot going on at P38, which is what we think is probably sort of a differential uh, amount of de degradation of that receptor. Um, at this time, but it's done by P54. So it's this very precise timeline. But this is just visualizing the receptor in microglia. We wanted to be extra sure that the microglia are actually lysosomally degrading the receptor. Um, and so to do this, Ashley used a marker called CD68, which is a lysosomal marker. So this is how microglia take in a protein and then chew it up. Um, and, and uh, discard it, essentially. Um, and again, this lysosomal marker starts to peak at postnatal day 30. And then the most important figure in the whole uh, thing here is that the amount of C3 tagged D1R specifically in this CD68 positive lysosome in microglia, it peaks precisely at postnatal day 30. Um, and so it's a very sort of precise time window of microglial elimination of this receptor. All right, so why? Why on earth are they eating dopamine receptors at postnatal day 30? Well, again, going back to what we think may be really important during this period of reward circuit development at, in adolescence is social behavior, and we know dopamine signaling is critical for uh, social behavior broadly across the animal kingdom. But in adolescence in particular, there's an increase in so-called peer-centric social interaction. So this is actually a study from humans, uh, which I think is pretty funny, which is basically asking um, people of different ages, children, young adolescents, older adolescents, adults, etc. Um, which information do you trust the most? Do you trust information from your friends or do you trust information from a trusted adult? And notably, only young adolescents trust information from their friends <laughs> instead of a trusted adult. Every other group is like, yes, definitely the adult. Um, so something very interesting happens in early adolescence where there's this shift to, I'm paying attention to my peers. So how on earth do we test this in a rat or a rodent? Um, well, about this time, another postdoctor in the lab, Caroline Smith, who had done much of her PhD work looking at um, stereotypical play behaviors or rough and tumble play behaviors um, in rats. And she taught us how to score this um, behavior. And what's interesting about this behavior is that, again, it has a very distinct developmental time course and it depends on dopamine transmission. 
And this is one big reason that we're continuing to use rats as opposed to going to mice where we have more transgenic tools, although we're doing that as well. But in rats, they show this play behavior, whereas mice do not. Um, and so Ashley and Caroline basically tracked what does play behavior look like over the course of normal development. And the way they did this was to isolate our experimental rat for a day at different developmental time points. And then a day later, you put them in with another rat and see how much they play. So in this case, they're all like us in the middle of COVID. They're very motivated to play after being alone. Um, and, and again, an advantage of rats, they're actually very happy to, um, to play together instead of fight each other. And what they found consistent with the literature is that this play behavior indeed peaks precisely at postnatal day 30 and then declines. And it's not because of change in activity or overall exploration, which doesn't change developmentally. So does this D1R pruning have anything to do with the play behavior that you see? So we needed a way to prevent microglia from recognizing the D1R and then degrading it. And so the way we did this was using a uh, a factor called neutrophil inhibitory factor, which is actually uh, a peptide produced by a hookworm, so a parasite that doesn't want to get ejected from the immune system once it's in its cozy host. So it binds very specifically to the CD11B subunit and occludes its ability to bind any other ligand, including C3. This drug is actually very safe. It's used in humans. And so what we did is first show in vitro and cultured microglia that if you just ask how many fluorescent beads do microglia eat in the presence of this drug, they eat fewer beads. So basically it's knocking down their phagocytic function. And then Ashley found that if she infused it into one uh, hemisphere of the accumbens and ask what D1R does, Basically, then she found that D1R is elevated in the hemisphere that receives NIF compared to the vehicle-treated hemisphere. So we're very specifically preventing microglia from being able to recognize that C3 tag so they're no longer eating the D1 receptor. So then the question is, what does this do to behavior? So Ashley infused the drug bilaterally this time into the accumbens precisely at P30 when we know that microglia are eating the receptor. And then a week later did the play behavior task. And so the prediction here is that play should now be low because they've sort of passed the peak of play behavior, which is at P30. And instead what she found is in the presence of NIF, play behavior remains high because they're, the microglia are no longer um, pruning the receptor, pr presumably, right? But to test this precisely to make sure that this is indeed a D1 mediated effect, um, she then did this, the same experiment again, plus or minus siRNA against the D1R. So in this case, asking, okay, what happens if you block microglia from eating the receptor? but you still knock down D1R, what happens to play behavior? So first she confirmed that D1R is indeed knocked down by the siRNA, even in the presence of NIF, and that's what you see here. So indeed the D1R expression is still dramatically lower, even though microglia can't recognize the C3, so those are sort of independent effects. And then what happens to social play? I'll take you through each of these groups because um, uh, it's a little complicated. But if so, if they get vehicle plus a scrambled version of the RNA, then play is low because again, this is at a time when play should be back down to sort of adult levels. If they get vehicle plus siRNA against D1R, it's low. But if they get NIF plus the scrambled RNA, so now microglia can't prune the receptor and you haven't messed with the receptor itself, so D1 is, is high, then the play is much, much higher. But if you give NIF in the presence of D1R, so uh, siRNA, so you knock it back down, then play is low. So we're very precisely able to change behavior in a D1R-dependent fashion 
and it's dependent on this microglial engulfment of the D1R receptor. And again, for all of these, it's independent of total activity, it's independent of total social exploration. Um, this is a very specific impact on play behavior, which is what is developmentally regulated. Okay, so one note about all of this, everything that I've showed you so far has been in males. And that's because females are completely different. <laughs> it's not that we haven't looked at females. Um, I'm not presenting the data here in this talk because they're completely different. But um, long story short is that microglia do not appear to be pruning the D1R in females. And if you give NIF into the nucleus accumbens, it has absolutely no effect on D1R expression. Um, so we think females, of course, are very important, and we're very interested in what the mechanisms are underlying this sex difference, because we think it's, it's in incredibly important. Um, but at this point, we have no clue what's happening in females. So we're continuing to look at both males and females in all of these paradigms. Um, and hoping to make more progress in what's happening um, in females. Okay, so to conclude uh, most of this part of the talk, um, what I've shown you is that microglia uh, we know are critical for the refinement of synapses during critical periods in developing circuits. Uh, I've shown you now that microglia engulf and eliminate D1Rs very precisely within the nucleus accumbens um, in males only. And this is complement three dependent. Um, this engulfment by microglia and elimination of the receptor is necessary for the normal developmental expression of play behavior. And females are different. <laughs> so many, many questions. One is whether this is actually synaptic pruning. So I told you at the beginning that we know microglia prune synapses. And we now know that microglia eat dopamine receptors. So this is a really interesting question because as you likely know, dopamine receptors can be expressed um, in the spine, so in the postsynaptic density here, but they can also be expressed along uh, the axon or along the shaft of the spine. So it's not uh, automatically assumed that because they are engulfing and eliminating the D1 that they're taking the whole synapse along with it. And that, of course, matters quite a bit for later function, because if they're taking the whole synapse, then there's all kinds of other things that are going along with it. So this is a question we're very, very interested in. And there is a, a sort of a rationale for going after this. So we know that microglia don't simply eat the entire uh, synapse. There is a precedence for their sort of nibbling of components of membrane, which is a word uh, called trogocytosis, sort of an odd word, but basically the idea, again, that they're simply nibbling out parts of the membrane or, or parts of the synapse, we think. So is this happening? And one of the ways uh, that we're going after this is asking questions about a second question we have, which is, is this pruning activity dependent, much in the way that the synaptic pruning has been shown to be activity dependent? And then, of course, what are the implications for addiction? So some of the ways we're going after this question is to use a chemogenetic approach where we're using either excitatory or inhibitory dreads, um, so expressing them in the VTA and then projection into the accumbens, so either uh, increasing dopamine input into the accumbens or decreasing dopamine input, so simplifying the signal as much as we can to dopamine itself, what happens to the receptor uh, in that case, what happens to microglial um, interactions with that receptor. And then getting at this question of whether it's a whole synapse, whether it's parts of membranes, we've uh, started to use a, a transgenic mouse model, D1R TD tomato mice uh, developed here by Nicole Kalakis, in which we can visualize the entire cell really well with microglia and, and hopefully uh, see whether they have sort of parts of the membrane inside and whether this is larger or smaller than, than simply um, the receptor itself. But we already have some insight into this question of whether receptor pruning 
is activity dependent. And this is based on an experiment that we did a few years ago in which we were interested in the impact of morphine exposure during this adolescent period. So we did a very similar condition place preference task that I've already explained to you before. Um, but in this case, naive rats receive five days of either morphine or saline during adolescence. We then test morphine CPP in adults, we extinguish the behavior, and then we tested reinstatement. And what we found is that this adolescent exposure has no effect again on just that initial reward on the test day, but it profoundly affects their reinstatement. So again, a consistent impact on reinstatement. So only the rats that had received adolescent morphine pre-exposure now strongly reinstated to a low dose of morphine, whereas those that received saline did not. And then in the interest of time, I won't show you all this, but we then used a butylast again at the time of morphine exposure and say, you know, so what happens if you give a butylast at this time? Can you prevent that reinstatement? And that's exactly what we did. We found that it completely prevented it. And these data are published if you're interested in the details. At the time, we didn't know the mechanism. So, so what was going on in terms of this? How does it persist all the way to here? Um, but we now are wondering if it has to do with this pruning of dopamine receptors. And the reason I say that this is sort of getting at that activity dependence question is because we know that morphine very specifically activates D1Rs in the nucleus accumbens, um, and it doesn't activate D2. Um, and so we think that by using morphine, we are again getting at this precise activation of D1. And so the question is, does morphine impact that pruning behavior? And we have just a, a bit of preliminary data on this, but the answer is yes. So if you look at um, the pruning of the D1R in rats that receive either saline or morphine, again, during that adolescent period, we find that C3 overall is, is a bit elevated. Although interestingly, the tagging of the D1R is not. But if you look here, at the amount of D1R that's engulfed by microglia that is tagged by C3, it's markedly lower in the morphine exposed rats. And we think that this is probably leading to then a persistent increase in D1R into adulthood. And this is um, a question that we're currently uh, working on. So to conclude all of this um, and sort of touch on what we're uh, doing going forward, um, I hope I've convinced you that neuroimmune signaling is critical in addiction and reward. We think microglia impact these processes via both the things that they produce, their secretive factors, but also via their direct sculpting, sculpting of neural circuits, including synapses and receptors. Now, at the conclusion of all of this, I think you, I may have left you with the impression and microglia are the bad guys here, <laughs> and that uh, if we could just maybe sort of silence microglia or shut them down, that we would make addiction uh, better. We would uh, reduce uh, these different drug-seeking behaviors or drug-taking behaviors. But in a whole series of experiments that I don't have time to tell you about, mostly using transgenic mouse models so we can very precisely knock out different genes in microglia, we found that this is definitely not true. So if you knock down toll-like receptor signaling, specifically in microglia, it actually makes everything worse. So mice take more opioids, they take more uh, alcohol, they drink more. Um, and we think it's because by knocking down that function, it's also interfering with their phagocytic function. So it's complicated. We think that it's really, really key going forward to understand this cell-specific signaling. So what is it that they're producing? What is it that they're eating? And that just knocking them down altogether is not a very good um, solution. And then finally, the last thing I'll say, timing is critical. We need a developmental lens for many of these things. We're looking not only at the adolescent period, um, and this is my final uh, slide here, um, it, we're, but we're also very interested in the what's happening before birth 
and working with Elena Chartroff at um, Harvard Medical School, um, McLean uh, Hospital, where uh, another you know heartbreaking statistic here is that uh, with the opioid epidemic, we have an increase in babies born addicted to opioids. And so what is the consequence of that for these long-term outcomes? And so she has rats that are self-administering oxycodone, and then we're taking the offspring and looking at endpoints in those offspring. So I'll end by thanking um, my amazing lab that does the work. Um, this is uh, the Bilbo Lab, the album cover. Um, so, um, of course, in the middle of COVID, um, but uh, all the alumni that have sort of contributed to this, this work, of course, is funded by NIDA. We're just starting to work on alcohol as well. Uh, and of course, collaborators, Ed and, and others. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Well, thank you, Stacy. That's just uh, marvelous and, and very comprehensive in terms of the cellular and molecular aspects as well as the behavioral functional uh, endpoints. So uh, now we, we do have a, uh, a few minutes for uh, questions. Um, I'll start off. Um, the butylast uh, effect seems pretty remarkable and um, useful. Um, so opiates are widely used for pain relief. Um, I, hopefully a butylast doesn't block that effect. I mean, have people tried using uh, a butylast together with uh, opiate medication to avoid uh, abuse liability whenever it's used therapeutically for pain? I don't know the answer to that. I think most of the work with a butylast has been with alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that has been effective to the extent that it does reduce drinking. But the unfortunate thing about abutilas is also has some nasty side effects. So it makes, um, it has some GI distress issues. Mm -hmm. And so it makes the treatment of something as particularly alcohol or, or opioids for that matter, not, not ideal. And I mentioned that um, there's another drug which is similar called a premolast which has now gotten um, a lot of really, really promising clinical data for the use for both opioids and alcohol again. And it doesn't have the same side effects. I'm not sure why. It's also a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. Um, but I think, you know, combined, those, those two drugs are really, really promising. I mean, bringing people down from drinking eight drinks a day to virtually none, you know, like really, really profound effects. So I think it's really exciting that, um, that these things are sort of emerging now. Interesting. Um, I open it. Uh, anyone else have uh, questions that they, um, just unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I think, it's, is it Karim? Um, if Ted had a quick question. Yeah, it's Karim. Um, Karim. Great talk. I had two quick questions actually. So um, earlier in the talk, you showed that the amount of microglia in the nucleus accumbens kind of correlated with the high dose responding and low dose responding rats. Um, do you know if it like it has your group or any other group kind of looked at whether or not you knock down microglia or remove them from the brain, whether you can shift this responding um, and get high dose responders to become low dose responders? Um, and the second question that I had had to do with kind of this interaction between the microglia and D1 uh, receptors. And I was curious if you guys looked at D2 receptors at all, because a lot of like the rewarding effects with um, these D1Rs kind of come from an interaction between uh, like a competitive interaction between D1 and D2Rs. Um, and so I was curious if you see the same effects in the D2R, which I think you touched on a little bit towards the end. Right. So we have not done the sort of, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, we haven't done the sort of comprehensive D2 engulfment by microglia, but we are starting to, to look more at D2, particularly in the females, because there seems to be a different thing going on with females. And um, if I'm remembering this correctly, I believe what we're seeing is actually a peak in D2 in females and it's a D1 peak in males, which is really cool. So that maybe that's why we're not seeing the same mechanism happening in males. Um, but yes, we're very interested in D2 and you're totally correct that we need to you know, look at the sort of the yin and the yang here of, of that system. Um, your first question is 
Um, yeah, so the, you know, manipulating microglia, as you may know, is, is uh, unfortunately sort of an all or none thing. So there are mechanisms in which you can knock out all microglia. I'm not sure if anybody's ever done that in the context of addiction. Uh, I'm trying to remember if there are any studies, but what I did mention at the very end there um, is that we have started to do uh, experiments in mice where we knock out uh, toll-like receptor signaling specifically in microglia, which very efficiently prevents them from responding to inflammatory stimuli. Um, so the prediction would be that they would then show uh, resilience in the face of addiction. They would not show as much drug taking and they show exactly the opposite. So they take them, they, they relapse more to opioids, they, they drink more alcohol, like twice as much alcohol. I mean, it's, it's really striking. So we're trying to understand that. So I guess, you know, the take home there, as I said, is microglia are not the bad guys. Um, they're clearly doing things to, we think, to stabilize the circuit. And the question then is, you know, what, what happens if you remove certain elements of their function relative to that behavior? But it's a good question. So um, if Thank we you. Carry, carry on for a few more minutes, we have a couple more questions. Uh, Catherine Martucci, uh, would you like to ask your question? Sure, yeah, I was curious, is it known, I mean, your data seemed like it suggests that adolescent opioid exposure is, could be detrimental to addiction in the future. So is this, is this, known or established and are there protocols for surgery where they don't give them opioids? Do they tend not to? Do you know anything about that? So, I mean, so some of the, the um, stats that I showed, it's definitely known that, that adolescents that take drugs during the adolescent period are much more likely to show addiction phenotypes later in life, right? Um, so that, that's definitely known. We, we didn't show that for the first time by any means. Um, but in terms of whether you get treated, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Like if you have to have surgery as a teenager, does it mean you're doomed to being a, an addict later? I mean, I certainly hope that's not true. I don't think there's any literature uh, really uh, suggesting that. I think as I as I. Uh, introduced all of this, it's complicated. I mean, there are a lot of like social and environmental factors that also contribute. But um, in terms of just the, I've been surprised actually, maybe this is what you're getting at. I've been surprised at just the lack of literature of if you have drug exposure during adolescence and you look at mechanisms like we're looking at, like D1 expression, you know, which is, you know, everybody looks at D1 because of addiction, like this is not a novel thing. But then what happens later to the function of those receptors or the function of these circuits? There's not much, you know, it's like, it's, it's people look sort of acutely at the time that they're looking, but then what persists later in terms of the actual mechanism? There's, there's not enough, in my opinion, in terms of what we know. Yeah, and I'm doing human clinical research through using neuroimaging for the most part. So I'm really curious once these things have already happened to yeah. see, you know, what what does the brain look like at that point? But I just I hadn't heard anything about surgery from the anesthesiology department and people saying that, you know, you can't give opioids to adolescents, but I'm curious if that's actually important. So thanks, thanks though. That's really helpful. Great talk too. Thank you. Well thanks. And finally, um uh, uh Brian uh, Campos Salazar, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, it was a great talk. Thank you, Professor Stacy. Hello there. Hi, Brian. Yep. yep. I think Karin asked part of the question that I had. It was regarding the first part of the talk involving the use of remifentanil, to be honest. And it has to do with the fact if have you checked any inherent difference in these low responders regarding to like a maybe an anti-inflammatory profile that could be, I don't know, related to this phenotype. And the second question that I have, even though it's, I think, a little bit redundant, but do you think if promoting an additional inflammatory environment in this neonatal handling model would like worsen the phenotype of this reinstatement of the, of the, I mean, of the, I think it was 
well, well this addiction seeking behavior. Yeah. So would it would it uh, sort of cancel out the effects of, of yeah. handling? Yeah. Actually, I haven't done that in the context of addiction, but I have done it in a different model, which is a neonatal infection model, which causes a persistent microglial sort of sensitivity and handling sort of brings them back to normal, but it's not enough to make them more resilient. So I think that's exactly what you would find, that this sort yep. of enriched maternal care is enough to rescue to some extent, but it's not going to be completely productive in the face of other sort of insults. True. The first question is the million dollar question, right? So could you say if this rat or human has baseline high levels of IL-10, within the brain going into an experience with a drug of abuse, would that be protective? And that of course we can't do, right? We can't, cause you'd have to take the brains out and then test their behavior. <laughs> so, so, but that's sort of what we have tried to address, right? In the, in the lab with the handling paradigm, which we know increases IL-10. So we sort of create a group that has increased IL-10 and then see what happens. But that's the million dollar question. What are these resilience factors uh, that, you know, going into an experience with an addictive substance are um, protective? And I think IL-10 is one of those things. And I think that something as simple as enriched maternal care can actually pretty profoundly modulate the expression of that. So I think that's what's exciting is that, you know, a lot of the work that we're, we're showing is it's not like these you know, crazy manipulations or interventions. These are really simple things, simple behavioral modifications that are changing cytokine expression very persistently and are protective in the face of drugs of abuse. Well, thank you so much um, for um, your answers and the nice discussion and, and a, a brilliant talk. I, I'm really uh, I'm looking forward to the further developments. We'll have to have you come back and, and tell us uh, once you've answered all these uh, million dollar questions. Uh, so um, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know uh, March 24th is our next seminar. Uh, Kathleen Kantag from Boston University talked to, talk to us about the extinction memory and cocaine and relapse prevention. And also, if you've missed any of the talks, uh, they are available on the uh, um, YouTube channel. Uh, um, and uh, just look on the CABC site. There is a link there um, um, for those uh, talks. And uh, um, Thank you again, uh, uh, Stacy, and, and thanks you all for coming and have a great day. All right, thanks.